she has normal sex drive. I have a normal drive. sex drive, but I'm a homosexual. She is a man, so naturally she has normal What type of sex, sex drive, drive do you have? I don't have any. My need for sex is just second to my need for food, and that need is not fulfilled unless it's with another man, and, and that's the way it is. It never occurred to me that he would leave his wife and come live with, with me. I mean, And yet we were to be together. How? We didn't know. It was faith. Faith that we would. I knew it was wrong, but I knew I wanted it, and I didn't care if it was wrong or not. It's the, it's the matter of, it's just a matter of accepting yourself, you know. I mean, at times, you know, I hated him, you know. I mean, especially right after the, the sexual activities. I mean, right then, I hated him. Because Why? I, well, I felt, it, I felt guilty and ugly, you know, dirty, you know. Well, after I graduated from high school, I, I really, I didn't have any homosexual experiences for about two years or so. As Why as was that? That I can remember. Uh, instead, I just masturbated. That was the supplementary thing. But it was, again, another period of trying to reject my own homosexuality. I just know that when I have sex with a man that I, I find, it, it's totally different from my wife, even though I love her. Surprising, you bet. Shocking, of course. Because nothing in the whole spectrum of American life is so emotionally charged as male homosexuality. Nothing as socially stigmatized, legally entangled, morally mixed up. Surely no drive so basic in mankind, so potently felt and widely exploited in modern life, has ever been so little understood, thus so fraught with fear and venom, passion and prejudice. Its numbers incalculable, its strength unmeasured, its meaning as unexplored as the meaning of sexuality and human freedom itself. But these are its sounds, happy and sad, masculine and feminine, cynical and ingenuous, above all, confused and contradictory. Some are high with humor, others are choked in pathos. All are passionate and concerned, a cross-section of our common humanity. The sounds of people of all ages and colors, all shapes, sizes, and sexual gradations, all beliefs, prejudices, capacities, and but a single common bond. All are homosexually oriented in a society where homoerotic love is taboo. This in spite of findings by the noted Kinsey Institute for Sex Research that two males out of every five that one may meet has at least some overt homosexual experience to the point of orgasm between adolescence and old age. A much higher percentage is attracted and aroused by the same sex. Still, no one knows with any certainty its cause or its cure, or if, indeed, it is even a sickness. Most psychiatrists tend to feel that it is an arrested development resulting from childhood trauma, but they are far from 100% agreement. We only know there are no absolutes, that no child has a total choice in his sexual orientation, and anguished cries of sin, depravity, crime against nature, disease, immorality, or even abnormality are value judgments grounded mostly in habit, herd instinct, and history. The significant thing about homosexuality today is not merely the freer expression with which it is practiced, but the increasing freedom and compassion with which it is examined, discussed, and treated. It is as if at long last we have recognized, however painfully and reluctantly, that we are at the kindergarten level of sexual maturity, that the meaning of our sexuality, whatever shape it takes, begs a bold new perusal as well as a new posture, that sexual behavior is one of the most compelling of human drives, and that responsible sexual freedom may well be a road to psychological freedom and mental health. Thus, it is hardly surprising that, as one wag has put it with some pith, the love that formerly dared not speak its name today will not shut up. For the human being is neither innately heterosexual nor homosexual, and there is nothing unusual or abnormal about his occasionally engaging in homoerotic acts. Dr. Albert Ellis, sexologist, 
and author of an apparently endless number of psychosexual books, claims a high degree of success in redirecting homosexual behavior. Exclusive homosexuals, however, are disturbed for several reasons. One, they convince themselves that they cannot possibly enjoy heterosexuality without ever really trying to enjoy it. Two, they usually are terribly afraid of rejection by females, of competing with males, of sexual impotency, and of marital responsibility. Three, they do not merely prefer males to females, but are compulsively driven to seek one conquest after another, to have affairs for egoistic instead of sexual reasons, and to magically try to gain masculinity by merging with other males. Four, they become and remain fixed deviants largely because they are highly inadequate, self-condemning, perfectionistic, anxiety-ridden, depressed, dependent, injustice-collecting individuals. The majority, though not all, of these fixed deviants are not merely neurotics, but are actually borderline psychotics. There may be somewhere in this great land a truly happy and mature confirmed homosexual who has chosen his way of life by calm and open-minded preference. If so, I have yet to meet one. And it is doubtful that he ever will, which is part of science's problem. For there is little reason for the happy or self-accepting homosexual to subject himself to the rigors of possible change through therapy. Obviously, only the emotionally disturbed person is going to pay the high price of professional help. And then, say the experts, only about one in ten of these ever seeks it. When analyst Ernest Van Den Haag was told by a colleague, all my homosexual patients, you know, are quite sick, Dr. Van Den Haag countered, ah yes, but so are all my heterosexual patients. Most homosexuals and some authorities are unalterably opposed to Dr. Ellis's view that there are these discernible neurotic traits in all so-called fixed deviates. Researchers state there is enough evidence to show that in a fairly sizable number of people, homosexuality is not inherently a form of illness, nor is it accompanied by a form of illness. Most therapists find that the motivation to change is very difficult to maintain. The gay life offers very attractive rewards. The whole pattern of social relationships is different. It takes great self-discipline to give up the gay life, the pleasure and the fun of being with these men who are happy, or at least think they are happy. A middle-aged schoolteacher and brilliant linguist from a small town in Indiana, now residing in Chicago, uh, commented. Yes, I'm, I'm happy with my sex. Uh, I enjoy sex. I like sex life. Uh, as I get older, I find that uh, I, it's just not a, a central thing to me as it was a younger person. But then I look back rather wistfully and wish that I could go back and do it all again, I suppose. And all the evidence indicates that, considering the tremendous drive of human sexuality, no law or moral code is going to stop a compulsive homosexual or deviate from seeking his homophile heaven. Even in the face of public prejudice, legal pressures, blackmail threats, religious strictures, and the internal conflicts they induce, this homosexual resigns himself to risk and penalty. Listen to a college-bred youth from Whittier, California, who has been arrested twice for oral copulation in a public place. Well, I feel that I am doing what I want to do. I may get, rest get arrested uh, three or four more times before I die. It's just something that I accept. Living a promiscuous life, uh, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, it could happen several times. And uh, I have a savings account, and I have a reserve of money for this. This is the life I'm going to live, and this is the penalty you pay for living this way. This is the way I am, and this is the way I'm going to be. And no amount of uh, fines, imprisonment, jail, disgrace, none of that's going to stop me. Similarly, a young school teacher who opt for a homosexual relationship with a fellow teacher over what he felt was a hypocritical one with his church. That he will adhere to. I know of many homophiles who might have sex one night, and you know they might go down Main Street or something and um, have sex with everyone on that street, and then they must make sure that they're to mass on Sunday the next morning. Well, to me, that's uh, that's not being true to, true to oneself. 
so I finally decided it's going to have to be either me or the church. And I decided, well, in this case, it's going to be me. And I've been happy. <laughs> Since he has been happy, one might reasonably assume that there must be advantages, however dubious, to life outside the purview of mere sexual pleasure. For sexuality alone never satisfies the gnawing loneliness in any man. As one homosexual poet has written, I have enjoyed every pleasure to satiety. Now I am the victim of free-floating anxiety. The fact that there will be no children is an advantage, which means that any income we earn does not have to be dissipated in raising a family. We can spend it on each other. Uh, another advantage is the fact that uh, we don't have to worry about uh, some other person discovering that we're queer. We might admire a beautiful painting or a seascape or a piece of glass or something like this. And uh, not that we're going to get you know, emotional or use words like, you know, oh, how darling this is, or, or you know, a typical feminine type of language. But we can do this and be ourselves and uh, not worry about what the other one is going to think if he's going to think that I'm being feminine or something. The feminine type male, the swish, the Nelly, the queen, long identified as a typical homosexual, in actual fact plays an extremely small part in the half-world of the homophile. But because flaunting female mannerisms and sometimes makeup and clothes and adopts his own highly defensive jargon, his presence is more keenly felt. He is a cultural shock to heterosexual society and a dismay to the vast majority of homosexuals who try to live respectable lives. He is one of the homosexual types who is seen as truly sick by all of the experts, and some feel he is the only homosexual whose sickness could be genetic or glandular in origin. The masks he assumes to allay his fears are usually as hostile as they are pathetic. These are the jumbled sounds of the hair fairies, homosexuals who dress like men but wear women's makeup and hairdos. What they are actually saying is of little consequence. Oh, right. In the daytime, she wears her daytime makeup. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I do. I won't go anywhere without my No, during the day, makeup. she wears colored eyelashes with different oh, colors, wow. rainbow. Oh, talking about eyelashes, I am. Boy, how do we walk down the street? Yeah. Can we start we walking a little slower? <laughs> Lovemaking is a compulsive suicide. Sexual's rationalization for his takes the tack of this Midwesterner. Nature, the male by nature. Just like promiscuous, though. In other words, I think a homosexual can go out and put the make on somebody easier than a man who go out and put the make on somebody beyond, let's say, a prostitute or something like that. Now, of course, there are many homosexual prostitutes, too. The homosexual prostitute is known as a hustler. He solicits incessantly and his very livelihood depends upon picking up other homophiles. Some are heterosexual hustlers who specialize with hustlers who specialize. I mean, in other words, they just simply do homosexual acts for money. They do love the concept of the but, you know, all the time you do to do. If you can do it, they will hurt no one. But the majority of homosexuals do not make their contacts with hustlers. If they do not confine themselves to a more or less monogamous arrangement, holding jobs and living a quietly domestic life, they cruise the bars, the private clubs, the beaches and the baths that cater almost exclusively to their furtive fraternity. Very often the bar or the bath is the scene of a man's initiation into the homophile community. Should the experience also mark a lifetime commitment to homosexuality, it is called coming out. And a wealthy, well-traveled, highly educated homosexual who moved from Ohio to California because of a more tolerant atmosphere remarked, traveling down one of the streets in Los Angeles and past a steam bath where there was a sign, steam bath and massage. So I went in and for the first time in my life, was exposed to a gay Turkish bath. And I, I was completely frightened. <laughs> Everything flashed in my mind. Fear of police, fear of venereal disease. But I can't say I was so concerned that I didn't go back again and again <laughs> and again. And this was my introduction to homosexual life. 
that I began developing my little black book, which every homosexual carries, listing the favorite spots all over the world. And thus began a new phase of my life. This same man states the advantages of the bath over the gay bar as a meeting place for sexual activity. And the reason I enjoy a steam bath is that uh, if it's a gay steam bath and is known to be a gay one, you know that everyone there is homosexual. You've eliminated the guesswork. You know that everyone is there for one purpose. You know that they're clean because they've been steamed and, and showered. And if you find somebody with whom you wish to have some activity, you can consummate it there in a matter of minutes. And whereas if you meet somebody in a bar, you face all the questions. Is the person a member of the vice squad? Is he actually a hustler? Where do we go? Is he clean? Will I, will I have to ask him to shower first before we go to bed? And all of these problems are eliminated in the steam bath. Not only that, but you see the merchandise. And so it's a very, very satisfactory outlet if it's sex that you're looking for. And that's really all it is. It's basic sex satisfaction. Uh, you very seldom ever arrange to meet a person you meet in a steam bath again. It's a one-night stand. It can be very, very satisfying. It can be a, an excellent release. I have uh, visited perhaps dozens of steam baths at one time or another. I've now built my own. <laughs> Fear of the vice squad and search for anonymity pervades the homophile world in the U.S. more than any other nation. At the present time, homosexual acts are illegal in every state except Illinois, where consenting adults of the same sex may do what they please in private. The average homophile fears exposure. It can, of course, mean the loss of his job, friends, and family. It can drive him from his church or other social group. It can impair his usefulness to society, for it almost certainly impairs his self-respect and thus his productivity. It externalizes the alienation that haunts most homosexuals internally. It is this fear, in addition to the condition of homosexuality itself, that is most responsible for the emotional and mental turmoil of the homophile, for it drives him to a life of lies, deceit, duplicity. It imbues him with guilt, shame, loss of self-worth, and even a sort of horror of himself. Listen to a young homosexual from Orange County, California. Well, I think you have to live two lives. The life that uh, when you're working, you're careful. You don't throw it in everybody's face. When you go out to the theater, you eat in a nice restaurant, or you're walking down the street, there's no need to, to broadcast it and you uh, are careful and then when you're in the privacy of your own home you have friends over you can do what you want or you go to a homosexual bar or different gatherings then you're the homosexual a 27 year old university graduate from salt lake city remarks that's a lie i, I don't enjoy lying i don't like to i feel that there should be anything in my life that i should have to lie about I have guilt feelings in the fact that I have to lie in order to maintain my integrity and my acceptance in society. I wished I didn't have to. This same young man displays a trait familiar to therapists, that of actually finding stimulation in breaking the laws governing homosexual acts. In every other area of his existence, he is a high-minded and law-abiding citizen. Unfortunately, physically, I exist in a male body, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, whatever, I am attracted to a man. There's kind of an element of uh, excitement and challenge in the fact that, there is, that it is against the law, and the element of, of trying to uh, be able to go out and 
and be homosexual and, and try to meet someone in, a, in, a, in, in an environment that you know is dangerous. In other words, the fact that, you know, it's against the law that, that sort of stirs up your, it's a temptation, stirs up your interest to be able to go out and get away with it and not get caught. But most homophiles would agree with H.L. Mencken, who said, injustice is relatively easy to bear. What stings is justice. And homophile leaders in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, and San Francisco have accused the police of harassment, entrapment, and brutality in their enforcement of the laws. The police countercharge that homosexuals are trying to establish a fruit world. In any case, tension and bitterness between the law and the homosexual is frequently relieved in homophile humor and song. Down by the river drive, down by the river drive, I thought that he gave me the eye as he was going by, down by the river drive. He asked me if I had a light. Wait up. He gave me quite a fright. Wait up. There in the bright moonlight, Wait up. there was no one in sight. I thought that he looked simply great. Wait up. His eyes said, make a date Wait down up. by the river drive. He ain't gonna cruise that drive no more. He ain't gonna cruise that drive no more. He ain't gonna cruise no more, no more. I gotta move it right along while I sing this little song. He ain't gonna cruise no more. Well, it dawned on me this guy was straight, but I could hardly wait. I left it up to fate. He'd be a festive date, but right before my very eyes, I got a big surprise up on that river drive. He pinched me while he flashed his club, he said. Come on now, Bob. You've made a final club, and there's one less in your club. He took me to the station house. Yeah, yeah. That guy was quite a louse yeah, yeah. up on that river drive. Yeah, yeah. Well, the judge, he gave me 30 days and offered this advice. The drive is just no dice, and it's full of sin and vice. When you get out, I think you'll find you won't see your kind hanging around that river drive. If there's a moral to that story, it is that decoys or entrapment will fail to deter or even curb homosexual activity. But again, the possible side effects of arrest threaten the homosexual constantly. A homosexual from the East Coast who held a position in the civil service, whose stiff anti-homosexual regulations govern 93% of all federal employees, is highly reluctant to accept his homosexuality. He refers to his own kind as they, never we. I think perhaps this is the greatest fear, the, its loss of employment, perhaps the disgrace that might come along with it, and even publicity in the newspapers, which sometimes accompanies. Uh, accompanies this sort of thing and I think I don't think the police department recognizes the situation there they only seem to be interested in making an arrest and thereby ruining people's lives and I don't think they realize the damage that they're doing I think if a person carries on uh, becomes very obvious and carries on in a public toilet or out in public places where it's disgusting to the public I think then they're asking for trouble, but if they're going into a bar, they're minding their own business, and they want to socialize within that bar with their own group, I don't think they're breaking any law. Uh, they should be given the same opportunities uh, uh, as other people to lead a regular life, and what they do in their own private homes and so forth is their own business. His sentiments are supported by a graduate of West Point, who attained a very high rank before he was exposed through blackmail. I believe that it is a normal reaction for man to love, and this love can be given to a dog, kitten, another man, or a female. Uh, for the young man that's teetering on the fence between homosexual and heterosexual life, condemnation by the family or the society about, about him of homosexuals and the realization within himself that he has some of these qualities would tend to drive him deeper into the, this withdrawn self, which would in itself bring out more of these qualities rather than having him seek more than what you call the normal life or free association with everyone. Uh, in the military, the man who becomes known uh, officially, let us say, as a homosexual immediately is uh, 
uh, you might say castigated uh, socially. Uh, certainly in other media this is true uh, too. Uh, of course in other uh, forms of business like entertainment world it may help you <laughs> uh, get a job. Uh, but it should not. It should not be a measure of uh, whether you get a job or maintain a job or anything else and all all I hope that is at one time that the young man who is a homosexual will be able to face his military obligation with hopefulness, with expect expectancy, a time for him to grow, to see the world, to do other things that his uh, brothers who we claim are normal uh, do without fear or intimidation. Now he must learn when he can do things and uh, to keep his military life, his duties, you might say, and his social life or sexual life separate and in good taste. There is nothing, there is no bribe in the world capable of making me tell any uh, top secrets or secrets or making me do anything against my country or desert or do anything to harm my classmates from the academy or any of my soldiers. There's nothing in the world. In effect, this Freemasonry of kindred feeling is echoing the lady who, at the time of the celebrated sodomy trials of Oscar Wilde, said she didn't mind what they did, so long as they didn't do it in the street and frighten the horses. While such a permissive view has greater support today than ever, it is light years away from rigid reactionary mosaic law which the Christian church inherited and which still has enormous influence in England and America. Nevertheless, the Church of England and powerful Roman Catholic groups have given surprising support to the now famed Wolfenden Report, a study by church, legal and government leaders which has been debated in Parliament since 1957 and approved by the House of Lords. The government appointed Wolfenden Committee feels simply that private morality cannot be legislated, that one cannot try the mind of man, and that restriction of the individual's freedom of choice in areas of private morality is itself morally improper. It concludes that homosexual behavior between consenting adults in private should no longer be a criminal offense. A similar recommendation was adopted by the American Law Institute, which says that deterring sexual behavior because it might be sinful, morally wrong, objectionable for reasons of conscience or of religious or cultural tradition is the responsibility of religious and social bodies and not of the state. Enlightened religious leaders tend to agree, and while they are far from being in accord on their judgments, there is creeping progress. A highly influential report from the Quakers in 1964 declared that homosexual affection can be as selfless as heterosexual affection, and therefore we cannot see that it is in some way morally worse. Further, they charge that a distorted Christianity must bear some of the blame for the sexual disorders of society. These next voices bear out that charge. I met someone that, uh, that uh, a man that I became so interested in that we had our first sexual relationship, homosexual relationship, and it disturbed me very much to uh, continue in the religion because they preached that this was uh, sinful and against God's, you know, laws. So I couldn't um, very well remain a true, what they call a true Christian, by breaking their laws, so I got out of the church. I, actually, I didn't get out, they pushed me out. Uh, they uh, uh, had a little meeting, and I had to plead uh, my uh, guilt uh, before them, and they uh, just, what would you call it, excommunicated me from the church. It is no small tragedy that many homosexuals are made to feel they must choose between God in heaven and man on earth. The editor of a number of publications directed to homophiles, among them U.S. Crews and World Report, comments. The Catholic Church can accept them or not accept them as they damn well please. It has come to the point now where we are, what I would say to the Catholic Church, I don't care. 
because sexuality is stronger than the crucifix. The Protestant churches are not, most of the Protestant churches are no longer so uh, imbued with the idea that the homosexual will uh, uh, ruin them. And a homosexual who addressed a clerical group in Pasadena, California states. With the law, if the church could work to restore society's faith in the homosexual as an individual, and the homosexual's faith in himself, and get us out of the bars and into doing something that's worthwhile, and I don't much care what it is, because we could be fertilizing flower beds in Pershing Square, and it would be more worthwhile than the way two-thirds of us spend our time. A minister from Detroit, who covertly practices homosexuality, comments. Well, when I was coming up, uh, I remember that I was anxious about my homosexuality and felt that it was wrong at the beginning. And uh, I went to a minister, a uh, famous, a very famous minister with a radio program. And I'd heard about him and I went to see him. And uh, he gave me a very puerile kind of counsel, which was, well, date some girls and go to dances and uh, this sort of thing, which was not really an answer at all. And I was completely disgusted by the whole, the whole thing, that I'd gone to the church for help, and uh, I had uh, asked the minister to counsel me. He gave me stupid advice, and then the, the uh, member of his congregation tried to put the make on me. And so I just felt that the church was not the place to go for help with regard to uh, homosexuality. This same minister challenges his fellow homosexual to seek truth and to touch reality through something other than his sexual skin. My personal feelings were then pretty much what they are now, that uh, homosexuality uh, ought not to become a way of life for anybody. That is, uh, it ought not to be the lifestyle of any individual that um, I was interested in Christianity as a lifestyle rather than uh, some other subculture, which I think homosexuality can become for people. And this is what disturbed me about the people whom I knew at college who seemed to abandon everything that they had culturally in favor of giving themselves to, to this as a lifestyle. And I thought this was sad to see everything to see the world from this point of view and to, to interpret all events and all culture and all literature and music and life in general, all relationships in terms of, of one's own uh, uh, sexuality or uh, even worse, towards an adopted kind of attitude towards sexuality, which was, I think, uh, which I think is an inadequate one for to make a lifestyle from. Chicago's father, James Jones, former prison chaplain and an Episcopal rector, is sympathetic to the plight of the homosexual, but blames him for allowing his sense of specialness to separate him from the church. Here he is in confrontation with a homophile. The theoctus sex is not in conflict in regard to sexual or homosexual activity. A lot of guys, a lot of men I know, um, have had uh, affairs or, or at least have wanted to, you know. Uh, somehow somehow they're yeah. able to, to continue to, to love their God and say they're... I, 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 I sometimes wonder, how come, again, if homosexuality is so damn natural, how come the homosexual cannot more naturally participate in the church, which is a hospital for sinners, not an old age home. Everybody else in my congregation is sinning, see? Right. Everybody. And, and somehow, by the process of redemption, makes that greater good come out of whatever evil he's been participating in, which is the redemptive process of the Christian religion, and looks up at that crucifix and understands that. But somehow the, the homosexual seems to get hung up over here that he is something special. His sin is something so great and so unique and so marvelous that he can't join the, the, the general 
a, a sewer of humanity. And, yeah. and, and this, I challenge the well, homosexual I with. I really do. I challenge the homosexual to stop being so damn proud. Smug. His sin is pride, but not sex. But you're a 20-year-old kid. Oh, no. Not no, a no, homosexual. I'm not at all. I'm talking about a bunch of proud fags who well, can't young, come though, aren't down, they? Who can't they come young? down to earth and face that they're no more or less sinful than anybody else. But aren't all 20 years old? Yeah, but now there's no accident to this. And you see, this is this is the psychological problem, and it is the the degree of, of perpetual infantilism, if not perpetual adolescence, the degree that, that exists in homosexual culture. But sex that? is the sport of adolescence. Yes. And to participate sexually, you've got to keep yourself and on adolescence. And it gets a little boring to hear a bunch of 50-year-olds sitting around talking like 16 That's really, they should be out with adolescence. Well, pardon my bag, man. <laughs> As Oscar Wilde put it, the sins of the flesh are nothing. They are maladies for physicians to cure, if they should be cured. Sins of the soul are shameful. Yet the religious homosexual must wrestle with forces other than the sin of pride. Here, the homophile son of I a bishop. Parents are, I can't really speak for everybody, but if your your father is a w very well-known theologian and is very strict uh, in the ways of the Bible, you just uh, cannot go to him with a something like this because in his mind, something like this just does not exist. Because if it isn't from Genesis to Exodus, just does not exist. And I got to the conclusion, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to be a hermit or, or what? Uh, are you just going to be uh, completely sexless the rest of your life, or are you going to look for, you know, enjoyment where you can get it? This same young man first tried to resolve these conflicts within the sanctity of a heterosexual marriage. Today he has a two-year-old son, a divorce from his wife, and a homosexual partnership which has brought him little peace of mind. I think this problem with me right now is very critical because I can't make up my mind which way to go. I realize I cannot have both. I have got to make up my mind. Uh, either I'm going to go into the what's so falsely labeled the twilight world, or I am going to go into what is so, again, falsely labeled as respectability. I mean, I have no family, no uh, nothing to, to stop me from doing this. But yet there's something that stops me uh, from accepting it all the way. And I think this is one of the problems when I'm at the crossroads right now, which I don't really know which way to go. On the other hand, some homosexuals apparently feel they have sufficient heterosexual orientation to make a marriage work. They have married not because of their homosexuality, but in spite of it. Paul is 23. His wife is 20. They live in the Northwest. I, um, I'm not jealous. In the least. I'm not afraid of it. It doesn't bother me. It's just one of those things. Why should I let it bother me? It doesn't have anything to do with me. It doesn't have anything to do with our relationship. I am heterosexual. I cannot even put myself in the shoes of a lesbian to try and understand. There are certain aspects of his life that I will never be able to understand, but this doesn't mean that I can't say, he can't, um, it's not his fault that he's this way. He's got to learn to accept it, and I do too. I can't put the strings on too tightly and say, all right, no. It's got to be just me and no one else. Because I am not capable of fulfilling him completely because he has needs that a heterosexual man does not have. I have to just learn to accept it and realize that he loves me for myself. That he needs me in ways that he doesn't need men. And he needs men in ways he can never need me. What do you then find in a woman that you don't find in a man? I think the main thing I, I, I have found is that uh, I can find sexual pleasure in a woman. By that I mean I can... I can reach a climax. Well then, if you find that much pleasure in a woman, then why do you still feel a need or desire for a homosexual relationship?
because that only fulfills part of the aspect of my sexuality. The other part is a psychological aspect of it, and this I can only find through a man. What is that psychological aspect? The love of another man, for me. One can question if Paul has faced the internal remorse, guilt, and eventual shame of this marriage, and if his wife will be able to withstand the internal conflicts and problems that are virtually beyond solution. A young man from Utah is one of the uncountable millions who would like to have an answer. Yes, I've often thought of that, most definitely. Why? That is the big question of every homosexual. Is why am I what I am? And my personal opinion is I've never found a satisfactory answer. I do not know today any more so, more than I did then or at any time. And I have never known anyone who can answer uh, but I, I don't know why. I know that, uh, that being homosexual is not easy. It's quite naturally, it's not accepted. Um, but uh, when I am able to make contact with a man, I feel that this brings a, a deeper satisfaction and gratification for this need of being accepted and being not alone than it would if I was with a woman. Not that I want it this way, not that I like it that way, but that's just the way it is within me. And I've tried to change it, and change it I have not been able to do. And why I'm this way, I don't know. Mm -hmm.